Good day, everyone. Uh, this is your teacher, Ms. Morris, and on today's video lecture, I am going to talk about our topic on Unit 3 in the subject um, Stylistics and Discourse Analysis. So at this point, allow me to share my screen to everyone. So our topic here is unit three, and that is literary prose and drama stylistics. So we have actually four um, lessons under unit three, and these are the following. Number one, lesson one is prose fiction. Lesson two is drama. Uh, lesson three is survey of prose authors or dramatists. And lesson four would be stylistic analysis of prose. And on this video lecture, we are going to uh, focus on uh, two lessons that would be lesson one and lesson two, which are prose fiction and drama. So, okay. So prose fiction. By definition, a prose fiction is actually a type of writing that employs basic storytelling techniques that include dialogue, narrative, exposition, and so on. And you know that, obviously, because you have been looking into prose, into uh, short stories in your previous years. So these are the things or the basic things that we are going to look into if we say prose. You know, It includes dialogue between characters. It includes also narrative, exposition, and a lot more. And fiction is any word that is not a narrative of reality. From the word fiction, it is just a product of a mere imagination of the author. The story is instead, of course, conceived by the author himself. While prose fiction may be based on real events, that's for sure. There are like fiction that are based on uh, true uh, life stories and people, but the actual characters and plot of the story are actually made up. But it's just that the, the theme is based on, on a specific experience or a specific event that happened in real. But if we are going to look into the characters, those are actually made up. The plot of the story, those are made up, which can open up possibilities for fantastic events that could not take place in reality. No? Let's say, for example, um, science fiction. Let's say another example would be a specific love story that is just a matter or a product of the imagination of the author. Well, to be honest, um, the, the, the experience of the character characters could be based on really the real experience or events but the thing is everything else that goes with with a with a inspiration of the real events are actually just made up and that's why it is still fiction so everything becomes actually like fantasy now that definitely could take place in reality but that is still fiction now, prose fiction, it is an artistic work, that is for sure, and it is a personal narrative, a hero to identify with fictional invention, style, and even suspense. So this is something that is also very unique no? in prose fiction. There is suspense because the, the pacing of the story actually progresses. No? Like in the first, we have the, we have the, um, you know, we kind of have the exposition, okay? And then it, it progresses into something. So that's why it definitely could be, you know, you could feel a suspense. And, and of course, some fictional inventions. Uh, we look into the characters and even the play. So it's a matter of show, don't tell. That's actually the main rule if you are a writer, if you're a creative writer, is that you have to make sure you, you um, definitely um, describe, describe really specifically and vividly the characters, the settings, what the characters are doing to create a very um, clear picture of what is happening to the minds of the readers. So um, that's 
that's the thing about prose fiction being an artistic work. And in short, anything that might be handled with the rather personal ventures of creativity and artistic freedom that is a prose fiction. But of course, it is um, written in paragraph form because it's prose. No? And like poetry, poetry is written by verse, okay, so line by line and one verse, stanza, so we do have the stanza, but here we wrote it in paragraph form. And, um, and we do have also um, the form of the novel or the short story that is an example of a prose fiction and the most popular and widely consumed literary genre because a lot of us really are into reading prose fiction. Not much or not, not a lot of people are into reading poetry, but a lot of people read a prose fiction, specifically novels. You know, it could be in English or some of you may be really fond of reading novels that are written in Filipino and written by local authors. And since talking about earlier, you know, there is really a progress of the events that are happening in our prose fiction because we know also the stages of the story as it could progress um, from exposition and that there will be a rising action, a climax, a falling action, and a resolution. So that is how it is expected to be. You know, every story obviously has an ending. So Siguro, by far the only story that does not end yet in, in, the, in the series that you guys have been following is the Ang Provinciano, no? But um, yeah, but it is consists of so many episodes anyway. So next, prose. This is the most typical form of language and it is derived from the Latin word prosa, which means or lit, which literally means straightforward. So prosa means straightforward. It reflects the pattern of everyday speech because we present it in paragraph form. And it is systematically produced and published within literature. We do also publish this in journalism, like newspapers. There are short stories published in newspapers, magazines, and broadcasting, even encyclopedias, you know, film, history, philosophy, law, and in almost all forms and processes requiring human communication. So next, what is the structure of prose? So the structure of prose is lacks the more formal metrical structure of verse. So that is how it differs with the poetry and comprises full grammatical sentences. Like we cannot present a prose that is in phrases. We have to make sure we have, uh, you, we have sentences and those sentences are grouped together to form paragraph and so on and so forth. And some works of prose contain traces of metrical structure or versification and a cons conscious blend of the two literature formats known as prose poetry. So it could also be like that, no? that some works, is a, some uh, prose works definitely are blends of two literature formats, which are prose and poetry. So most reflective of ordinary, often conversational. Now, there are types of prose fiction, as what I have told you and mentioned earlier, novel. Novel can be defined as an extended work of prose fiction, and it actually is derived, this is derived from the Italian novella, Little New Thing, okay, in English, which was a short piece of prose. Their term denotes a prose narrative about characters and their actions and what is recognizably everyday life. So a lot of you probably is into reading novels. And uh, you have to know that novels come from Italian, that is Italian word, which is novella, and little new thing. That is the meaning of that. And the novels develop various subgenres. So we have epistolary novel. Um, the epistolary novel, the narrative is conveyed entirely by an exchange of letters. So it happened before, no, a long time ago, uh, people are into letters and then exchanging of letters and you could come up with a story based on the letters and I believe uh, Cecilia Mangera Brainard um, has written something like that though it's not a novel but it's a short story but she wrote something like exchange of letters and that is um, one of the stories that could be found in her book um, in the book titled uh, in, in a book about creative or fundamentals in creative writing or fundamentals of creative writing. So I have that book and um, 
it is so good to read, you know, her stories if you have not checked um, that book. So epistolary novel, the narrative is conveyed entirely by an exchange of letters. And um, that is one of the, of the ways of communicating before is to send letters. And of course, it is very evident, uh, specifically on these examples, you know, for example, those that are written by Samuel Richardson, the Pamela here, Pamela, if you are going to check this out, you can check this out online. And these are all some of the examples, Flowers for Algernon, um, The Color Purple by Alice uh, Walker, and then Daddy Long Legs. Uh, this Daddy Long Legs is actually an anime series, no? and it's 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 from a novel um, written by Jean Webster. So this is through an exchange of letters. That is a very good example. In fact, this is also, um, there is an anime of this one, oh, Japanese anime series with the same title, My Daddy Long Legs or Daddy Long Legs, where Judy Abbott um, really communicated with, with her benefactor, the one who sponsored her studies through a letter. So she uh, contacted her benefactor and they exchange series or they exchange letters to communicate with each other. So you can check these out online. Next is picaresque novel, an early form of the novel. Some call it a pre precursor of the novel. It actually presents the adventures of a lighthearted rascal, Picaro Rogue. It is usually episodic in structure and the episodes often arranged as a journey. So we do have here um, a video. Okay, let's put this. We have here a video, and then let's try to look at um, more information about picaresque novel. Picaresque novel. The word novel is derived from the Italian word novella, from the plural of Latin novellas, a late variant of novus, meaning new. It is a genre of fiction. It is an invented prose narrative of considerable length and a certain complexity that deals imaginatively with human experience. Picaresque novel. Okay, so this is it. Um, additional information about picaresque novel. So it is uh, from the Italian word picaro, which means rogue. And there is also an example of um, picaresque novel. So it is an early form of the novel. Some call it a precursor of the novel. Okay, next, historical novel. So I think it's self-explanatory, you know. When we say historical novel, it takes its setting and some of the chief characters and events from history. So it develops these elements with attention to the known facts and makes the historical events and issues important to the central narrative. We do have here example, Walter Scott Ivanhoe and one of the famous writers, classic writers, Charles Dickens, looking into a tale of two cities. So. Also, if we look at a local example, we could see the, the novels written by Dr. Jose Rizal. We have Noli Mitanghere and Il Filibusterismo, which were, of course, based on the history or events from history. So let's have an additional info.
Actually, the story's detail need to be reading a story that takes place in the 16th century. What would you think if one of the characters picks up a cell phone? The story would lose its believability, because we, as readers, know that cell phones did not exist during that time. In order to avoid losing the story's believability, writers of historical fiction need to research the story's time period. The writer should know things like what the people ate and wore, and how they talked, so readers are willing to believe in the story and keep reading. Now, some works of historical fiction mean to be incredible, in which case the improbable or absurd details would be used purposefully. For example, in Seth Grammy Smith's parody novel, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, 2009, the story takes place in the 19th century, and while the characters sound and read as authentic for the time, the casual interjections of man-eating zombies, while not historically accurate, are written in for the incredible effect. In literature, historical fiction's purpose can be both to entertain and to help readers reevaluate a past society. There is some debate, however, about how much distance is needed to make the story historical fiction. Some consider it to be anything written at least 50 years after the story's events, while others years. Does reading about the past interest you? What if it was a make-believe past? If you are interested in a reimagined history, historical fiction is probably for you. A genre in literature, historical fiction, is a work of writing that reconstructs the past. Often inspired by history, writers of this genre will incorporate past events or people into their fictitious stories. In order to do this successfully, the story's details need to feel authentic. If you are reading a story that takes place in the 16th century, what would you think if one of the characters picks up a cell phone? The story would lose its believability, because we, as readers, know that cell phones did not exist during that time. In order to avoid losing the story's believability, writers of historical fiction need to research the story's time period. The writer should know things like what the people ate and wore, and how they talked, so readers are willing to believe in the story and keep reading. Now, some works of historical fiction mean to be incredible, in which case the improbable or absurd details would be used purposefully. For example, in Seth Grammy Smith's parody novel, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, 2009, the story takes place in the 19th century, and while the characters sound and read as authentic for the time, the casual interjections of man-eating zombies, while not historically accurate, are written in for the incredible effect. In literature, historical fiction's purpose can be both to entertain and to help readers reevaluate a past society. There is some debate, however, about how much distance is needed to make the story historical fiction. Some consider it to be anything written at least 50 years after the story's events, while others say 25 years. Okay, so that is an additional information about examples of historical fiction. And um, I believe that we can also relate to because we have been reading or we have been exposed to historical novel before. And obviously that is our very own El Filibusterismo and also the No Limitangere as what I had told you. But earlier in the video, they gave a different example. So I hope you were able to follow that. Next. So we have here um, Bildung's Roman or Novel of Education. So it is a type of novel that originates in Germany, and it presents the development of character mostly from childhood to maturity. So a German word for novel of education or novel of formation, a novel which traces the spiritual, moral, psychological, or social development and growth of the main character from usually childhood to maturity. So let's try to take a look at um, additional information about Bildungsroman. A Bildungsroman is a story of education. It is similar to coming-of-age stories. However, the characters of the Bildungsroman are more specific. In order for a novel to be considered a true Bildungsroman, the main character has to experience some form of moral development. In essence, they have to grow up. The focus of the character's growth is the main thrust of the narrative. Bildungsroman is a German word. 
It was first introduced by Carl Morgenstern in the early 19th century and was later popularized by Wilhelm Dilthey in the early 20th century. The popularity of the genre first spread across the European continent and then the entire world. Today, the genre remains one of the most popular forms of storytelling. Some of the most classic stories in film, literature, and stage center around the story of a young person going out into the world and learning harsh lessons on their way to finding maturity. There are thousands of different Bildungsroman stories out there. So, although they share similar characteristics, they will not all be exactly the same. Here's a list of the genre's most prominent characteristics. There is a search for meaning by the protagonist, who is usually foolish and inexperienced at the beginning of the narrative. The story typically centers on the maturation process of a single person. There is some kind of inciting incident that pushes the protagonist into their journey. It's usually something akin to a great emotional loss, like the death of a parent. The journey will not be easy. In fact, there will be many failures along the way. The hero will be tested, and he will fight tooth and nail to survive the unwavering rules and limits of society. There is usually an epiphany, or a flashing moment where the hero finally gets it. This lucidity changes them as a person. They learn what it takes to be a grown-up in the real world. The hero will eventually find his place in society by accepting its values and rules. So obviously the video gives us really a very um, great description of Wilding's Roman. And this is a kind of novel that is focusing on the development of a human being, you know, from childhood all the way to his or her maturity. And usually this novel would definitely have the title of the character, be, you know, the, the name of the character as its title, because the focus is the character himself, how he grows into a better man, you know, so that's Bildung's Roman. Next definition of Bildungsroman, it is again a German word. Bildung has the meaning of shaping and formation and um, roman meaning novel. So definition, a novel that deals with the development of the protagonist, um, main character coming of age book. And then characteristics, we are going to look into some learns and lessons, moral development, psychological development, and maturity of a child. So for this here, in a Bildung's Roman novel, the protagonist will need to res resolve internal conflict. So it's, it's within himself. An example, To Kill a Mockingbird, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is written by Mark Twain. Chronicles of Narnia, Harry Potter series. That is an example of this novel. And then the moral here is dealing with right and wrong and psychological dealing with emotions and behavior, okay? So we do have also Gothic novels. So Gothic novel became very popular from the second half of the 18th century onward. So the aim is to evoke chilling terror by exploiting mystery and variety of horrors. The Gothic novel is usually set in desolate landscapes, uh, ruined abbeys or medieval castles with dungeons, winding staircases and sliding panels. So if you can just imagine the Gothic novel is really like the, the scenery here is really giving us chaos or really something that we don't want to be in because it is a trouble. So let's try to take a look at um, another or additional information about Gothic novel. The term Gothic fiction refers to a style of writing that is characterized by elements of fear, horror, death, and gloom, as well as romantic elements such as nature, individuality, and very high emotion. These emotions can include fear and suspense. This style of fiction began in the mid-1700s with a story titled The Castle of Otranto in 1764 by Horace Walpole. This story was about a doomed family and is filled with death, desire, and intrigue. This story is considered to be the first of the Gothic fiction tales, since it encompassed many of the characteristics of the genre. The term Gothic actually originated as a term belittling the architecture and art of the period, which was dark, decaying, and dismal. In spite of the jab, the term was embraced by the artists and was applied to the fictional literature of the same name due to its similar darkness and gloom. So obviously, class, the Gothic novel is giving us a theme or, or a scenery or, or a situation that we don't want to be in, you know, like, I mean, it's chaos, 
it's something that you know is all about trouble could be war could be famine you know if you look at the picture even so this is an example if you read a novel like that about that that is an example of a gothic novel then social novel, also called industrial novel or condition, um, condition of England novel, became particularly popular actually between 1880,000 or 1830 rather, um, and 1850, and is associated with the development of 19th century realism. So we have here some examples of social novel. And the science fiction, I know you know this, no need for me to really reiterate further because a lot of you probably would like to have this uh, kind of genre, no? would like to have this kind of novel. So the science fiction novel, it is a type of prose narrative of varying length from short story to novel. And its topics include quest for other worlds, the influence of alien beings on earth or alternate realities, and they can be utopian, dystopian, or set in the past. And everything is just like, becoming really bringing us to a whole new world if we read a science fiction. And a lot of you probably are into this uh, type of novel because it would bring you to another world and it would also make us believe that oh, aliens really exist. So things like that. There are so many examples of, of science fiction. And metafiction, so it is a term given to fictional writing which self-consciously and systematically draws attention to its status as an artifact in order to pose questions about the relationship between fiction and reality. So this is um, something that um, it's, um, I think that all of us are really familiar with, but these are some of the examples. We have the pencil, tomorrow most likely. And then romance. Romance is also one of the famous novels that, of course, a lot of us, especially girls, would like to read. No, Romance, it is a fictional narrative in prose or verse that represents a chivalric um, theme or relates improbable adventures of idealized characters in some remote or enchanted setting. It typically deploys monodimensional or static characters who are sharply discriminated as heroes or villains, masters or victims. So the central theme here is a lot, it is a love story that is the center of, of the, you know, that, that is where the story, you know, takes place or rotates around. That is the focus and it must have a happy, optimistic and emotionally satisfying ending. So uh, one of the really um, romance novels that is uh, very, that are very famous are those written by those that are written by, um, I forgot the name, but you know, like uh, the notebook, um, the wedding. So I have to check it. So those are written by, um, wait for a while, famous. Oh, Nicholas Sparks. Yeah, those are written by Nicholas Sparks. And a lot of you may be liking that. And some of us also, or some of you may be into reading uh, romance novels written in Tagalog. So that's like the page Arno among uh, among novels. But you being an English major, you have to make sure you read English um, novels. So, so that is another, that's another type of novel. And things, then things every romance novel needs. I love Triangle, but there should be helpers and harmers, a specific external goal um, of the character, masculine and feminine sensibilities. There should also be external conflict, internal conflict, the secrets that are uh, yet to be revealed, intimacy rituals, which is obviously should be there, internal change, happily ever after ending. So these are the things that are really um, a must if we are going to create romance novels. So these are some of the examples. You know, Pride and Prejudice is a no, uh, romance novel. It's written by Jane Austen. Uh, we have also this one. This is a New York Times bestselling um, um, author written by Kathleen E. Woodhouse. But I don't know, you know, I haven't read this or her novel. And then Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. I have read um, novels written by Nicholas Sparks. And yeah, Pride and Prejudice, I am very familiar with this. This is a classic novel. So next is we do have short stories. So short story class, it's a piece of prose fiction that is still under prose fiction. And it's marked by relative shortness and density. So it is not long compared to novel. It is organized into a plot 
end with some kind of denoma, denoma at the end or resolution. And the plot may be comic. It could also be tragic, romantic, or satiric. It may be written in the mode of fantasy, realism, or naturalism. And some of us are really into uh, reading short story in a novel because short story is really shorter compared to a novel. And what are the differences between a novel and a short story? So let's try to take a look at this. A short story can be seen as a slice of life. Okay, so it's just a portion of life. But a novel could cover the entire life because it's long and it is made up of chapters. A short story covers a narrow time frame. So in terms of time frame, it's shorter, it's narrow. But when you say novel, it could cover a massive time frame, like the entire century even, or you know, the entire decade it could be. You know? So a short story must often, or the entire lifetime of a person. So a short story must often only includes one geographical location. Okay, just one setting, but a novel could cover many geographical locations. And a short story can be anywhere, just from not 500 to 9,000 words, although most magazines prefer them to be under 2,000. A novel can be anywhere from 60,000 to over 100,000 words. So imagine a novel from 60,000 to over 100,000 words. And elements of prose fiction, you have plot. The plot is the author's particular arrangement of incidents in a story. So plot, the plot of a story refers to the action, the sequence of events. So the action here progresses toward a believable conclusion. So individual incidents or episodes are connected logically. And as what I told you, a plot could, you know, start from from you know, uh, exposition and then all the way to the resolution. What happened? What was the outcome? No, why did it happen? What will happen next? So these are the questions that we are going to really ask, okay? And it will be answered without, by the plot. So these are the elements that talk, we're talking first about plot. This is actually just a review class because you have been talking about this before already in your previous classes. And then character, the author's characterization or means of developing a character so that they seem real greatly affects one's attitude toward individual characters and toward the story as a whole. So the character is very important. And in fact, in your creative writing class, you have to flesh out the character when you create your character or when you create your story. You know? So your character should really be fleshed out, somebody you know very well. And it should be a character that really looks real, just like us human beings. And it depends if your character, or let's say, is an alien. You should make sure you, the character also looks like an alien, you know? So we have here a video to look into um, additional information about a character. Character can be defined as any person, animal, or figure represented in a literary work. There are many types of characters that exist in literature, each with its own development and function. Character development refers to how developed and complex a character is. Some characters start out as highly developed. For example, if we know something about how a character walks and talks, what she thinks, who she associates with, and what kind of secrets she has, she is naturally more complex and developed. Other characters develop over the course of a story, starting out one way and ending up different, becoming changed by what happens to them. Or you might only see one side of the character for a while, but at some point another side is revealed, proving the character to be more complex. The general purpose of characters is to extend the plot. Many stories employ multiple types of characters. Every story must have main characters. These are the characters that will have the greatest effect on the plot or are the most affected by what happens in the story. There are many ways to categorize main characters, protagonist or antagonist, dynamic or static character, and round or flat characters. A character can also often fit into more than one category or move through categories. Okay, so it's good that the video earlier that I showed talks also about the different types of character. And it doesn't mean, class, that in the novel or in the short story, uh, the beginning of the story, the character could be an antagonist, but at the end of the story, he, he or she could be a protagonist because he or she could change in the middle of the story. So it is up to you being the writer. It's up to the writer. And a dynamic character could become static. So it doesn't mean that in the beginning of the story, the character would always be just who he is until the end. And the next element we have are also character sketch. So a character sketch 
is a description of a character's moral and personality qualities written in paragraph form with specific examples from the story in question. So how could we write a character sketch? So method one is brainstorming characters, or if I may say in the, in the, in the lingo or in the context of creative writing is fleshing out, you know, free write about your character to get started. Make your character real. Don't create a superficial character or like an artificial character. Make it really real. Confirm the basic physical description of the character. That is true. This is part of the fleshing out process. We look into the age, gender, height, and weight, general ethnic background, defining physical characteristics because the characters are like that, no? Think about your overall, your character's overall emotions and feelings. Come up with the name of your character. You have to come up with a name. Determine the character's relationship to the story, world, or main character. We also need to develop our character's backstory, and we need to find our character's overarching, overarching motivation. So that is something really that we have also to look into. What is it that motivates our character? Okay, what happened to our character in the past? Because the past could shape him and we could understand the character because of the incident that he had in the past. And fill in any other details that pop into your head, you know, just a little bit of a addendum. And then um, it could give um, really interesting, um, really interesting characteristics also of our character. And distill your character's personality into two, into one or two sentences. And how to write a character sketch. There is also another method. And this method is using your character sketches. Number one, you have to realize that your entire character sketch isn't going to make it into your project. Number two, illuminate, illuminate your character through actions whenever possible. Let the characters act. Ask yourself why the character behaves like they do. There must be a reason why they are always angry, why the character is bitter, so things like that. Write a representative incident story about your character. Discover the character's voice. Use the first time you see a character to introduce their overall impact. Keep your character's sketches short and sweet if you're putting together a treatment. So name, motivation, what is the relation of the character to the plot, and plot relevant details. And character sketches are guidelines, you know, just explorations and even short stories that are essential for writers in any form. We need to do um, character sketch because this will guide us the way uh, the character would be in the story. You want to develop a consistent, realistic character early on so that you know how they would behave in any situation. Let the character be the character. The best stories feature characters that drive the plots, not plots that drive the characters. That is only possible if you know who your characters are. Because your characters are the are the let's say um, they are those who are you know making movement in the story okay they are the star dancers they are the star dancers no? or they are the main um, people who will be acting mobilizing things inside your you know creative work and then we have here settings, such elements as the time, place, physical surroundings, and social environment constitute a story setting, which you already know. Setting, it is a place, you know, the location, you know, the time, the atmosphere. And then point of view, point of view, it's how we tell the story, okay? Who tells the story, how it is told? The teller of the story could be the main character himself, the narrator, or may not be identifiable with the author but inevitably affects one's understanding of characters and events by filtering what is told through his or her closeness to the story and perspective. The term point of view, or POV for shorthand, refers to who is telling a story or who is narrating it. The narration of a story or novel can be told in three main ways, first person, second person, and third person. To determine point of view, ask who is doing the talking. If the narrator refers to him or herself as I or me, you'll know the story is being told from a first-person point of view. First-person narrators are characters inside the story and will provide most of the narrative. If the narrator speaks directly to the reader as you, the story is in the second-person point of view. This style is used more rarely in literature. If the narrator refers to all characters in the story as he or she, and knows their thoughts and sees their actions even when they're alone, 
the story is in the third person point of view. Okay, so there's no need for me to elaborate further about point of view. You know it, class. You know the different types of point of view. You know, first person point of view, second person point of view, third person point of view. And then story point of view we have here. Okay, it is obviously presented clearly with example. So check on this one. Symbolism, it's any person, object, setting, name, or event that suggests more than its literal meaning. It can be a symbol. Symbolic meanings are not so much hidden in a story as they are carefully placed and woven into the texture of the work. So let's try to take a look at a video and more about symbolism. Symbolism is everywhere. Symbolism exists whenever something is meant to represent something else. Symbolism is a figure of speech that is used when an author wants to create a certain mood or emotion in a work of literature. It is the use of an object, person, situation, or word to represent something else, like an idea in literature. Some common types of symbolism include metaphor, a comparison between two unlike things without using the words like or as. For example, the phrase time is money is an example of a metaphor comparing time to money. Money and time are two different things. This is an example of symbolism because these words show the importance of using your money and time wisely. Okay, so this is all about symbolism. And in fact, you have this one in your literary appreciation or criticism as well. Symbolism. And then colors. Often colors are used to represent various characteristics or emotions, you know. For example, this is still under symbol, huh? symbolism. The symbol of good or innocence could be associated to white. For the black, the symbol of evil, no? for example, uh, the witch, okay? Red, a symbol of love or courage, and it's a symbol of Valentine's Day. And next element, we have the theme. The theme of the story is actually the idea which binds the elements of the story together. So like, what is the main theme of your story? It may be explicitly stated or it may be communicated entirely through the elements of the story themselves. So it could be that the theme is essentially the truth or comment on life that the author intends to communicate to the reader. So if the it could be that the theme is all about uh, true love and conditional love, it could be the theme. Now themes in literature, we have judgment. We could also look into survival, peace and war, love, heroism, good and evil, circle of life, you know, suffering. We also have deception, coming of age. So these are the examples. And then we do have another which is style, tone, and irony. So the characteristic manner in which an author uses language to create specific effects constitutes his or her style and is influenced by such things as word, choice, the diction, sentence length, and structure, tone, and irony. And I already told you about style. No, We have been looking on, into this thing, you know, pag midterm pa lang. So an author's style will be contribute significantly to the meaning and effectiveness of a work. So this is it for our lesson one class. We talk mainly about prose fiction. And the next video will be all about drama. That would be lesson two. So thank you very much for uh, being, uh, for listening. So I hope you all are doing well. And I will have the next um, video lecture for unit two, or you not unit two, but lesson two, which is drama. So I will see you next time. Bye.